I'm not, um, I'm not a scholar, a uh, religious scholar, I'm not an academic. Uh, I was in Indonesia as a diplomat, as a layman. My background is in public policy, in kind of government public affairs, in kind of campaigning for change, <coughs> but not an academic. And uh, I'm here speaking today in a personal capacity, but I wanted to share some of my journey in Indonesia and some of my learning uh, with people at this conference. Um, I wanted to start just by saying a little bit about Indonesia, because some of you won't know it and others will, but some of you won't. And I wanted to just draw out some quick facts. First of all, for those of you who don't know, Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world. Um, it's the third largest democracy in the world, behind India and the US. It has the world's largest Muslim population. It's the 16th largest economy. And it's been growing at 5% a year. So in 10 years time, it will be in the top 10 of world economies. And perhaps uniquely around the world, it's a country that was born diverse. Most countries are on a journey from relative homogeneity to diversity. Indonesia was born diverse because it's made up of 17,000 islands with more than 500 languages spoken. It's 87% Muslim, and those Muslims are led uh, not exclusively, but led by two very large faith-based civil society movements, Nahdat al-Ulama and Muhammadiyah. Nahdat al-Ulama in U claims 40 million members, Muhammadiyah claims 30 million members. These are organizations that are not just running mosques or you know, propagating fatwas, they are campaigning on climate change, they're thinking about you know, women's rights, they're thinking about illegal mining, they're actually present in people's lives in a way that perhaps we're not familiar with in many, many other countries around the world. So in many respects, Indonesia is very special and very unique. Now, instead of kind of giving you lots of academic stuff about why it is unique, I wanted to share three or four stories to bring out what is special about Indonesia. Um, my first story kind of relates to actually my very first day in Indonesia. I arrived in Jogjakarta, which is the cultural capital of Indonesia to start learning Bahasa Indonesia, the Indonesian language. And uh, as I walked around the city, I was struck by the number of women riding motorbikes uh, wearing hijabs. Now, I've traveled extensively in the, in, in the so-called Muslim world, but I've never seen women wearing hijabs riding motorbikes. And this was an eye-opener for me, and I had two daughters in their teenage years at that time, and I stood there taking photos and sending photos to my daughters on WhatsApp saying, this is interesting, what's going on? In my first Ramadan in, uh, in Jakarta, I was invited to the presidential palace for a Nazul Quran function. So this is a, a kind of Quranic or a religious function in the month of Ramadan. And somebody in the palace had worked out that this new British ambassador chap happened to be Muslim, so maybe they ought to invite him. Uh, and so I went along. And uh, all the Muslim ambassadors, or ambassadors from all the Muslim countries were there, uh, the president was there, the ministers were there, you know, the television cameras were there, the religious the leaders of these two big faith movements I talked about were there. And the Quranic reading that was given at the opening of this conference was given by a female ulama. Now I sat there in this mixed group thinking, this is unusual. If I were to suggest this in my local mosque back at home, people would probably think I was slightly crazy and kind of first laugh and then try and chase me out of the mosque. But the TV cameras were rolling. <coughs> Nobody else batted an eyelid. And in an Indonesian context, the fact that this Quranic reading was being given by a woman was kind of regular. It was being broadcast on television. My third story, in terms of trying to give you a flavor of the uniqueness, relates to my second Ramadan in uh, Jakarta, where we went to uh, a jazz festival, which takes place, and has been taking place now, I think for almost 10 years, in the courtyard of the largest, oh, sorry, one of the oldest masjids, mosques in Jakarta, the Tutmutia Masjid. So they have a Ramadan jazz festival. Um, and it's a jazz festival where people start uh, playing music. They're not singing about sex, drug, and rock and roll, but it's a jazz festival. The headline act uh, last night was actually by an Indonesian Christian musician. 
and people are gathering after Tarawih, and uh, the music, and they continue up to to Subu, to Fajr, uh, and people are celebrating Ramadan through music in the courtyard of the mosque. And there are people there, Muslims and non-Muslims, women with hijab, without hijab, people with their children. They're sitting, they're relaxing, they're enjoying themselves. And it struck me that, again, if I was to go back to my local mosque, uh, in London and to say that we ought to celebrate a Ramadan jazz festival, uh, people might be quite challenged by that idea. And I tried it, actually. I, I went to uh, a number of mosques in the UK and told them this story and got in incredible reactions from people who said, this is, this is not allowed, this is allowed, we can't do this, to people who said, actually, we're struggling to get our children to come to the masjid. And maybe if we had a jazz festival, they might show up. We might be able to engage them in a conversation. My fourth story uh, relates to, um, so having experienced all this excitement, I started trying to get British Muslims to come to Indonesia so that they could see and experience this for themselves. And on one of the early visits, we had a group of British Muslims in Jakarta. And they met a number of uh, Indonesian Muslim leaders. And one of the Indonesian Muslim leaders they met uh, was a guy called is a guy called uh, Abdul Muti, who was the Secretary General of Muhammadi. Muhammadi is the more modernist of the two movements. Um, and in this conversation, the Secretary General of Muhammadi, a movement of 30 million Muslims, said that he, as far as he was concerned, Ahmadiyas were firmly in the Muslim tradition. Now, for the British Muslims in that room to hear that from the leader of a mainstream Muslim movement was incredibly challenging. This is not a mainstream view. If you were to go up and down to this country saying that in the mosque, people would kind of think you're slightly crazy. Actually, there would be many people in Indonesia who would say, Abdul Muti is holding a slightly dodgy view there. But despite professing this view, he could be the Secretary General of Muhammadiyah. And he continues to this day to be the Secretary General of Muhammadiyah. So I could go on. I have many more stories. But you get, you get the point. There's something interesting going on in Indonesia. And so, as a British Muslim, I began to ask myself, why? What is it about Indonesia that is special? What is interesting? What is going on? And what is it that we can learn? And there are many reasons, and there, we, could, we could spend a long time debating the reasons. But I think I found one of the reasons on one of my travels in Indonesia. So, Having discovered this excitement, I started going to Indonesian Islamic universities, uh, to madrasas, to Islamic boarding schools, meeting Muslim leaders, trying to get a sense of why, what is going on in this country. And on one of these visits, I went to a place called Gontor in East Java. So Gontor is a very, very famous uh, Indonesian madrasa. Um, my friend Parasan studied in one of the campuses of, of the Gontor school system. They have 17 campuses. And they have another 250, 300 odd uh, Islamic like boarding schools that are affiliated to Gontor and teach uh, the, the Gontor curriculum. And uh, I spent, there's about 45,000 students studying in the Gontor uh, school system, Sanri, uh, so the kind of students in the seminary, if you like. Um, and they've produced, Gontor has produced uh, people who are liberal, people who are conservative, people who, you know, the former deputy foreign minister was a graduate of Gontor. They produce scientists, they produce people of all colors, people with slightly liberal views, people with actually very conservative and quite extreme views too. So it's kind of very interesting in that respect. And uh, after Margaret Prez invited me to address the students, there were four and a half thousand Sandri there. But as we sat together after uh, Margaret Prez, I was talking to Piai Hassan. Piai Hassan is one of the sons, Piai means Ustad or, or kind of teacher. Uh, so he's, one, he's the son of one of the founders of the school. And we were talking about Gontor and its school system. And this is a school system that's more than 100 years old. And one of the founding values of this school is freedom. And I was very, very intrigued by this because in my career in traveling around the so-called Muslim world, going to institutions in South Asia, in the Middle East, and parts of Africa, and indeed traveling in the UK, I had never come across a Muslim institution that valued the word freedom. So I asked Kiai Hassan, why freedom? What is it about freedom that is special? Why is freedom one of your values? And he said that without freedom, within an Islamic framework, built on the Islamic tradition, 
But without freedom, there can be no progress. And as an educational institution, we stand for progress. And for me, it was a light bulb moment. Because what he was telling me that unless you are free to think and free to act, those were his words, how can there be progress? And without progress, what is civilization? It was really a very profound moment for me in my travel in Indonesia. And it told me something about what was special about Indonesia. I want you to it told me something about what was special in Indonesia, but it also told me something about what we were losing or is at risk as we look around the world. Because as we heard from Professor Ibrahim earlier, a lot of the time when we're talking about Muslim civil society and Muslim communities, we're struggling to deal with the ideas of freedom and progress. We're harking back, we're looking back, we're holding our texts, and we're looking to our past for guidance about our future. And as Professor Ibrahim so eloquently explained, the past is the past from which one learns it is not the future. So I want you to hold on to that question for a moment as to why we don't value freedom, because I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I've painted a picture of Indonesia that's quite special, that's quite unique. But it's also important to say that Indonesia is not disconnected to the world. So many of the things that we are struggling with in the UK or in other parts of the so-called Muslim world, Indonesia too is struggling with this. There are extremists, there are terrorists, there are people with deeply conservative views. This is the country which had the Bali bombings in the 2000s. And there were a number of incidents in my five years there as ambassador. In April 2017, the, the mayor of the governor of Jakarta, Ahok, he lost the election because he was a Christian of Chinese descent and the mainstream campaign that drove him out of office targeted the fact that Muslims could not be ruled by a non-Muslim. This is something that Professor Ibrahim mentioned earlier. I have lost the election because of that campaign. And a month later in May 2017, he was jailed on blasphemy charges on really very, very spurious grounds. This is also the country where in August 2018, a woman in Sumatra, Ibu Malena, was jailed for blasphemy because she complained that the mosque loudspeaker, when it was broadcasting the Adhan at Fajr, was too loud. And she was a Christian, she didn't want to be woken up by the loudspeaker. Because of that complaint, she ended up in jail for blasphemy. And this is also the country where, almost two years ago, Three families, over a period of a few days, mounted attacks on churches and police posts, and 28 people died. And some of you will remember the pictures, horrific pictures, of a family on a motorbike with children launching an attack, of a brother with sisters walking into a church to launch an attack, of a father with a son in a car trying to drive through the gates of a church. And thinking about that set of issues, extremism, of course I was interested in why. Why was this happening in Indonesia, just as why was it happening around the world? And of course the phenomena of extremism is complex and multifaceted, but it's also the case that almost all of these sorts of incidents, when they're committed in the name of Islam, are trying to use a religious justification for the evil actions. And we know that there is no justification for this, but nevertheless they are wrapping themselves in the garb of faith. And as I try to understand that ideological drift, which is one element of that multifaceted, that multifaceted background to the phenomenon of extremism, as I tried to understand that, and I read and I talked and I debated and I met Ulama, some of the people in Indonesia, some people outside Indonesia, what became clear to me was that the ideological bridge to extremism and indeed to violence is this idea of takfir. This idea that you can excommunicate people who are Muslims or that you can vilify people who are non-Muslims and somehow justify violence on the basis of othering them. They are not your version of Islam, they, therefore they are kafir and therefore they deserve in some respect to be sanctioned and ultimately 
to be attacked. This is what was driving ideologically that violence. But this is also where the two parts of my experience, the uniqueness and the extremism, come together. Because the very idea, this idea of that fear that was driving extremism and violence, is also the flip side of freedom and progress. Because what Piyai Hassan was trying to tell me was that we mustn't be afraid to think. But the fear to think comes from the fear that somehow by thinking and acting you will become the other, that you will open yourself to that charge of that fear, that being called a kafir. Now, coming to the conclusion that takfirism and this idea of takfir is at the root of many of our problems as a Muslim community around the world is interesting, but actually not a particularly unique insight. Because if you start looking on the uh, literature, you find lots and lots of literature with lots of ulama who are learned who say takfirism is bad and this is not part of mainstream traditions in Islam. You will find lots of fatwas on this idea of takfir. The Jordan Declaration, this declaration, that declaration. But the fact that it is still happening tells us that these fatwas, these declarations, whilst theologically sound, they have failed to engage the community. Just last year, Nahdat al came out with a, an advisory ruling that Muslims should stop using the word kafir. They were debating, this was a national gathering, thousands of uh, Kiyahi, they were debating the fit of, uh, of, of, of the medieval practice that, again, Professor Ibrahim mentioned, where Muslims required, Muslim rulers required non-Muslims to pay a tax. And in debating this, then you concluded that actually this medieval fit had no relevance to the modern state. In the modern state, this concept of kafir was actually immaterial and irrelevant. And that, in fact, we should refer to each other as citizens, that that was the relevant concept in a modern state, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. But nevertheless, this idea of takfir still continues to run riot. This idea of takfir is mainstream in the UK, in Muslim communities, as well as communities around the world. So the conclusion that I drew from all of this was that actually we do need to do something about this idea of takfir. We need to fight this idea of takfir. But it's not about fatwas and learned opinions. It's about public campaign. How does one engage the public to understand the danger that this idea poses to our communities, not just in terms of extremism, but actually in terms of freedom and progress and the lack of forward thinking. <coughs> we need to find ways to campaign to engage our young people. So that's my journey. That's where I got to in my travels in Indonesia and my own kind of the development of my own thinking. Where it goes, I don't quite know. And Part of the reason that I was interested in coming and speaking at this conference was to share some of that perspective that I gained in Indonesia, but also to ask this question, how do we eliminate this idea of takfir from the mainstream? How do we call it for what it is, a deviant tradition, and push it to the fringes of our faith? How do we build and construct that campaign in ways which engage young people? I don't have the answer to that, but I'd be really interested in debating that with you.